Next up on Blockdown is the founder of Ditto Music, a music company that supports over 500,000 independent artists worldwide, including Chance the Rapper and Ed Sheeran, and a whole lot more. Please put your virtual hands together for our next guest, Lee Parsons. Welcome to Blockdown, Lee. Take it away. How good was that intro? Thank you very much. Hello, everyone at Blockdown 4.0. I hope you're enjoying yourselves. I hope you're enjoying the ball run. We all deserve this. Um, everyone who's been here like myself since 2017, man. It's, uh, it's good times. Um, so today, I'm going to talk to people about NFTs and DeFi and the music and entertainment industry and what the problems we have, what I think the future is. It's going to be 15 minutes. I'm going to try and pack in as much information as I can. Um, if you want to tweet me, it's just CEO Lee Parsons. I've got my... Um, my friend next to me, who's going to be checking Twitter and stuff. So any questions you got along the way, welcome to all the people from Algorand, from my Twitter, from people I've been talking to, man. Um, thank you for watching. And I'll get straight into it. So my history, I started off as a musician um, around 10, 12 years ago. My brother and I were in a band and we got signed to a record label. And um, we were signed for about two years. And then the day our song was supposed to come out, they, they just dropped us. <laughs> and I'd never heard from them again. Um, and at that point, it was like 2007 and record labels were still trying to make CDs happen. Like they hadn't learned any lessons from Napster or anything that was happening. So my brother and I started a really small company in our bedroom called Ditto. And it was just, OK, well, we'll let artists keep the rights to their music. We'll release their music on digital stores. We won't do CDs. And in 2007, we got a contract with what was a brand new company at the time called Spotify. We were the first people to have a contract with them. And then we got the first ever digital top 40 single. In, in the world. And we had 12 top 40 singles still from my bedroom in that year. Um, and that was like the birth of digital music, man. And over the next decade, as the major labels all fell apart, we saw everyone kind of clambering over to us and, you know, looking at the new model. So far, Ditto have paid out, I think it's close to a billion dollars in royalties to artists. Um, some of our biggest artists currently are people like Chance the Rapper, um, but everyone from people like Ed Sheeran to, to anyone you hear on the radio at some point will have come through Ditto. But then in 2017, um, when I learned about blockchain uh, and Bitcoin and Ethereum, I was actually in the Philippines with, um, with a, a guy I knew who was a producer. And people had told me about Bitcoin, but hadn't really listened. We spent the whole day drinking these two cases of beer. And then he kind of explained everything to me. And I was like, man, this is going to change everything. So I got a flight home to England the next day. I took all the money I had out of the bank, put it all into Bitcoin. And I think it was about $2,000 at the time. Bitcoin went up to like $20,000. And the guy who was, you know, my guru at the time, maybe invest in all these other kind of coins. I lost pretty much all the money I had. And then I realized if you drink two cases of beer with someone for a day, he's probably on a Tuesday, he's probably not the best person to take investment advice off. So at that point, I started working in blockchain and I started looking at the problems that we had in the music industry, which are a lot. And then I started identifying how, how it can work. So today, as I said, I'm going to go through NFTs, why I think they're important, why I think DeFi is important. But firstly, I'm going to, I'm going to dive right into the music industry and I'm going to give you an example of, you know, one of the, this is actually the biggest song of all time. Um, I don't think I can ask any questions on here, but if anyone gets the answer, bam, there's a high five for you. So Mildred Hall wrote the biggest selling song of all time. Now, you've never heard of her because, you know, because of what happened following that, but Okay, the song was Happy Birthday. So Mildred was a teacher. Um, her and her sister, every day the kids used to come to class, used to sing them songs. It started off with, um, like, Good Morning to You, and then it evolved into Happy Birthday to You. Um, over the next 20 years, the song got a bit more popular and people started singing it. And then in 1933, a guy called Robert Coleman went into a studio, recorded the song, and, he, and then he registered it. At that point, the song was registered to Robert, and then every time anyone used that song, they had to pay for it. So what you'll see is any film after 1933, Hollywood film, you sometimes see them have a happy birthday moment, but they actually sing the song for He's a Jolly Good Fellow because they don't want to pay for the original. So Robert had, um, had, had ownership now of the song. He was earning money from it. In 1988, Warner Brothers came in and they bought the um, Robert's company for $5 million. And then they now owned Happy Birthday. Over the next year, over the next, from 1988 to I think 2018, they made $100 million out of the song Happy Birthday, $100 million, because they just put the prices up, they made everyone pay even more money to buy it. 
But the problem was they didn't own the song. They never owned the song. And they went through a court case with a judge and he said, actually, guys, you have no ownership on this song at all. This actually belongs to Mildred from back in 1859, who was born in 1859. But the problem is that was over 100 years ago now. So it's in the public domain. So as you can see, the biggest problem we have in the music industry is people aren't getting paid properly for their music. There's no proper registration of anything. And, you know, Mildred, who wrote a song that everyone, every, you know, we all sing every day, um, died penniless, unfortunately. Some big misconceptions about the music industry, right? A lot of people in blogs will tell you the music industry is dying and there's no money in the music industry. We are at the most lucrative point in history for the music industry. If you look over the data of the last, you know, from 2000, 2001, basically where it all went wrong, we were all doing well on CDs. Now you saw the fall off there from Napster and piracy and torrenting right down to 2012, 2013. And then in 2014, Spotify, which had been around about seven years at this point, started really picking up and people moved away from piracy and worked out that actually it's a lot easier to, to pay $10 a month on Spotify and, um, and earn my money. So absolute fortune at the moment in streaming. You get $5,000 for every million streams. So if you look at someone like Chance the Rapper, who has probably done a billion streams on Ditto Music alone, uh, that's two and a half million dollars just from, you know, just from that catalog. So that's where we are. Huge explosion of money, but the artists aren't getting the money. So why is that? Well, this is how the music industry currently works, right? You've got a song in the middle. It's made up of three pieces, every song, mechanical, performance, and sync. Now, I've written them all down there of what, what those all do. So every song that comes out has to be split three ways. Now, there are currently 270,000 different databases collecting that data. So that in itself, you're talking about, you know, three quarters of a million different data points for one song already. Then you flip it over on the left-hand side to someone like Beyonce that has 100 writers for that song. So then you're talking about seven, you know, seven, eight million different data points per song. So there's, there's really been no real way to track anything up to now. And the problem we've had was a lot of these societies that are collecting the money make more money not reporting properly. I'm in Brazil at the moment, and I think the statistics were like, 80% of the money that comes from radio never gets back to the artist because all the bodies holding it aren't exactly inclined to go in and then find out who owns the money. So those are the problems that we have within the music industry. Now, let's dive into NFTs now and why NFTs are important. We're in the middle of a bull run, right? So at the moment, we're going upwards, which is amazing. But everything historically will come down at some point and correct. Now, how do we know what the intrinsic value of an NFT is. If you buy an NFT today, you're kind of just speculating that that NFT is gonna be worth more money in, you know, in a few months and trying to sell it off. We're in a very short term market. People are trying to make, make money very quickly. After the NFT bubble closes and everyone kind of wonders what they've got, we're gonna hit the point where some real companies are gonna come through doing proper things with NFTs. And then we'll see what this true value of NFTs are. So what we're doing is, and how it interacts to the first few slides. We've been creating NFTs that are actually directly related to the music copyright because NFT at the heart of it is a really the best way to catalog an asset. If Mildred Hall had put her copyrights onto the blockchain as an NFT, that then is legally registered as an NFT and no one can come along and say, that's mine. As you, you see, so what happened to her in you know, 1933 when someone just recorded the song, they won't be able to do that with an NFT because it's it's her asset now. So that's why these things are so important. Take away all the kind of hype and everything else. That's why they're so important. So recently, Opulus um, had an experiment. We took two artists and we split their song into 125 different pieces. Um, we charged like $100 for each piece and it was an actual percentage of that artist's copyright. So what that means is all those people that bought it, they own an NFT, but also they own an actual part of the artist's copyright. So every time that artist gets paid from Spotify now, that person gets paid money as well. We had like, man, we, we did this experiment in about two days and we didn't know what was gonna happen. I had my mom standing by the computer to buy one because I didn't think anyone would buy them. And they sold out in like two minutes and we had about 10,000 people trying to buy these NFTs. So it just shows you what the perception of value is for actually you know, having something tangible. And then for the musicians, if you imagine um, a new artist coming through the platform now and they've got 5,000 people wanting to buy a piece of their catalog, just think how 
more interested they are in that music doing well. If you own a piece of someone's actual catalogue and you're getting paid every time it streams on Spotify, then you're going to be a lot more, you know, you're definitely going to want it to stream more than you would have done. So that's where we are on the NFT section. Um, another thing that we have a big problem with in the music industry is financial loans. Now, I've managed artists before, and I've, you know, you'll see a lot of things about bad record deals. Some of the record deals out there are as low as 9%, 9%. So an artist will sign away their copyrights, which, as we said before, the importance of having a copyright. They will sign away 91% of their future profits just to get a small advance at the beginning. And they do that because they don't have access to any funds. Now, if you imagine someone like a Chance the Rapper, if he goes to his bank and says, look, I'm earning you know, however much I'm earning per year, can I get a loan? The bank doesn't understand that copyright is an asset. Why do we have to rely on a bank to tell us what's an asset or not? Why do we have to rely on a third party to come in and say that, you know, and, and give us money or give us a loan? The next part of what, what Oculus is doing, we've created a DeFi system so the artists will be able to take a loan out backed by their past royalties. So someone like a chance who's been earning money for the last 12 months, we can actually see the data of what he's been earning for the last 10 years because it's all digital now. And I can pretty much comfortably predict what he'll be earning over the next 12 months. So he can come into the pool, there's a pool in the middle and say, okay, I wanna take a loan out, we give him the loan. Now on the other side of the pool, we have the crypto investors. And the reason this is very different from most DeFi farming or even BlockFi, BlockFi is an amazing product. Um, but what happens when Bitcoin goes down? You know, if you, if you take a loan out with your Bitcoin and Bitcoin goes down, you then have to top it up. So there's not really a way to have a stable loan. And once the bull market corrects, you're not going to see 15% staking on stable coins. You're going to see a lot lower staking on stable coins. You'll see a higher staking on Bitcoin, but everyone is going to be moving over to stable coins and need somewhere to put their money. Now, what Oculus does with the DeFi loans, it gives you a safe place to, to stake because you know, if you're staking that money and earning interest, it's gone somewhere on the other side and you can't borrow money unless there's money in the pool. So that was the kind of whole process of how we came up with that. Now, the way those two things go together and why I think, you know, aside from what we're doing, why I'm so excited about um, DeFi and NFTs is it's a brand new asset class. If you imagine someone can now go buy a piece of someone's music catalog that's earning a thousand dollars a month They'll then be able to go to Opulus and say, I'm earning $1,000 a month now. I'd like a loan for $5,000. And that will get accepted. And they don't have to go through a bank. And there's no middleman. And the person lending them the money is then earning interest from them. So it takes out the banks. It takes out the major labels. It gives all the power to the people that should have the power. It's like you and me. When I originally went to the bank to, um, to take my money out, to put everything into Bitcoin, <laughs> after 24 hours of hearing about Bitcoin, they wouldn't give me the money. And I had this big argument with them. I was like, I, you know, I want my money out of the bank. And they're like, no, you can't have it out because it takes the bank this and that. I was like, it's my money. Why can't I have my money out? And then this woman came out with this pamphlet saying, you know, I can get 0.5 interest a year if I do this and I do that. The banks are in, you know, the bank has not been good to us. I'm in Brazil at the moment where I think the inflation is so bad that if I leave my money in the bank, the interest is lower than the inflation and I just lose money anyway. You know, the banks have been making so much money for so long on the back of everyone else losing money. So from this point, I don't really have any, any fear. Most of my money is in crypto. If I want, if I, you know, it's either being staked or it's being invested in other stuff or it's being spent. And that is where the future is going to go. You can go in, take a, take, buy a piece of someone's asset. And that may not be a music copyright. There'll be other assets that we can trade as NFTs. There'll be pieces of people's house, you know, their mortgage, their rent that are earning the money. And then from that, we'll be able to go and get decentralized loans. And that right there is why I'm so excited about the future of, you know, what NFTs actually are. Am I on 15 minutes now? Yes, I'm on yeah. 15 minutes, I think. I've got to go. I'm just going to say one last thing. In 1999, Napster came about and it was the greatest invention of the last 20 years. It was complete peer-to-peer -peer music um, system and it revolutionized everything. Do you know what the major labels did? They spent 10 years trying to sue the internet. Instead of embracing it, they spent the next decade trying to stop Napster and stop the internet. And look how that turned out. But you know why it's gonna be different in this time? Community always moves faster than technology. Technology has to catch up to community. Bitcoin originally was a community. And this time we're all gonna win. So I'll leave it there. 
I'm in Brazil. I might go to the beach now. Um, anyone wants to catch me on Twitter, it's CEO Lee Parsons. Um, Oculus has a bunch of Telegram groups and Twitter and stuff. Um, I hope you all made it to the end of the talk. I hope you can understand me if you're not English because I know I'll rattle off pretty fast. Um, good luck in crypto. Remember to take some gains. And um, a big thanks to, um, to the conference again for having me on, man. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.